Douglas mustered up the courage to have a long overdue conversation with his wife. He knew it wouldn't be easy. Douglas and Isabel had known each other practically their whole lives. They grew up in the same neighbourhood, but at different ends of the settlement. In kindergarten, Douglas used to pull Isabel's pigtails, and in school he would play pranks on her. Isabel, on the other hand, didn't hold back either. She would hit Douglas with a textbook on his head, or come up with offensive nicknames for him. Douglas never had any romantic feelings for Isabel, neither in their childhood nor during their teenage years. Isabel was always a good student, not a top achiever, but consistently performed well. Douglas would occasionally copy her homework. During that time, Douglas was attracted to other girls. He was drawn to tall, long-legged and slender girls, like the ones he saw on TV. When Douglas left the village to study in the city, he met a girl like that. Her name was Bianca, and she studied at the same college, but in a different department. He was immediately captivated by her. She had a hold on him that he couldn't shake. From the moment Douglas first saw Bianca in the canteen, he couldn't take his eyes off her. He admired everything about her. Her laughter, the way she drank coffee, how she talked to her friends, and even the way she smoked. Beautiful, slender, and graceful, like a real supermodel. Of course, Douglas didn't dare to hope for anything between them, so he admired her from afar. A girl like her was out of his league. She probably had many admirers. But one day Bianca approached him. He was standing on the college porch waiting for a friend when he heard a melodious voice behind him. Do you have a cigarette? Douglas turned around and was practically speechless. Bianca was stunning. I... I don't smoke, Douglas finally managed to say. He regretted not having picked up the habit at that moment. It was all because of his parents' strict control and obsession with a healthy lifestyle. Who would have known that having a pack of cigarettes in his pocket would be so important to him some day? Too bad, Bianca shrugged. She was about to walk away, but Douglas stopped her. Wait, what brand do you smoke? I'll go to the store and buy some. Bianca told him her favourite brand, and without wasting a second, Douglas rushed to the store across the street. He was in such a hurry, afraid that she would leave before he returned, that he risked his life by crossing the road in the wrong place. Angry drivers honked at him and shouted, but he didn't care. The only thing that mattered was getting back to Bianca as quickly as possible. But Bianca was waiting for him. She was speaking with some girls, but when she saw Douglas approaching from afar, she said goodbye to them and stepped aside. Here, the guy handed her the packet. Thanks, Bianca said, giving her knight a charming smile, making her face even more beautiful. And you're cool. What's your name? They didn't go on a date that day. Instead, they stood and chatted about various topics. Bianca smoked cigarette after cigarette, looking a bit tired or annoyed. Later in the conversation, she revealed that she had recently broken up with her boyfriend. He turned out to be a jerk, she explained, and a cheapskate too. He would never go out to buy cigarettes for me like you, let alone do something more meaningful. And then Bianca invited Douglas to a party to the guy she knew. He was part of a local rock band and they were having a concert at a nightclub. True to his word, Douglas was there at the appointed time, in the same club. He felt out of place like a fish out of water. Douglas was a stranger, a lone wolf in that setting. But for Bianca's sake, he was willing to endure much more than that. Bianca herself approached him, giving him a hug and even a peck on the cheek, introducing him to her friends. Douglas didn't remember any of their names, but it didn't bother him because she was there. Her touch made his heart sink every time. That evening, Bianca kissed him. You're kind, she said as she pulled away from Douglas, who was stunned by the unexpected kiss. Good and reliable. The others are not like you. They are all selfish and mama's boys. With you I feel fragile and valuable. I can't explain it, but I really like this feeling. And so they started dating. Douglas had no idea how to handle such a wonderful girl, 
he felt like he wasn't on her level. She was used to being taken to fancy restaurants and given expensive gifts. She was accustomed to luxury courtship. But what could he do? In order to at least be able to sit with his beloved girl in a cafe, Douglas got a job as a sales assistant in the consumer electronics department. However, this meant skipping classes and facing problems with his studies, but he saw it as a small price to pay for the happiness of being near Bianca. One day, Douglas saw his beloved in the park, embracing a tall young man. Seeing this, Douglas froze in shock. Jealousy, anger, resentment and despair overwhelmed him. Bianca noticed his reaction, but showed no embarrassment. Ah, oh, hello, she smiled as if nothing unusual had happened. I thought you were at school. Go to the movies tonight without me. Tom and I agreed to take a walk along the embankment today. Douglas nodded silently, turned around and left. He had taken a part-time job specifically to take Bianca to the movies and then to a cafe. And now this happened. He felt betrayed, humiliated and crushed. It felt like a heavy roller had run over him. That same evening, Douglas found Bianca at the college and asked her to explain everything. Oh, I knew this would be difficult, she sighed. Well, yes, you're cool and kind, but I'm not looking for a serious relationship right now. I'm just having fun, you know? Today I hang out with you, tomorrow with Tom. We're all just friends here, okay? And love? I do feel love, but I don't want to discuss it with you. Do you really think there's something serious between us? Maybe it's my fault. I'm sorry, okay? Douglas took the breakup with Bianca hard. He had already made big plans for their future together. He dreamed of saving money to take her on a resort vacation, introducing her to his parents in the countryside, and building a life together with a wedding and children. Douglas envied his past self when he thought all of this was still possible. But now it turned out that their relationship meant nothing to Bianca. Douglas couldn't look at other girls for a long time. They were all, well, not like Bianca. Less beautiful, less attractive. The fear of getting hurt again held him back. Time passed. Douglas graduated from college, got his diploma, and went to the army. But even there, he couldn't stop thinking about Bianca. He wondered where she was, who she was with and how she was doing. After completing his military service, Douglas learned about Bianca's fate through mutual friends. He discovered that she had married a successful businessman who was almost twice her age. Perhaps this was the man Bianca had mentioned when she confessed that love was present in her life. Bianca was now a married woman, living abroad. It was time for Douglas to put this relationship in the past but he couldn't help but remember their meetings, her smile, laughter and hugs. Then Douglas's mother took matters into her own hands. First and foremost, she brought her son back home. There's no point in spending time in the city, his mother said when she came to visit Douglas. You don't have a stable job here. Rent is three times more expensive. Go back home. There's a vacancy at the construction company. You'll be better off there. You're wasting your time here. Go back. Douglas listened to his mother. Firstly, he was used to obeying her since childhood, and secondly, her words made sense. Douglas was tired of the city and being away from the place where he had once been happy with the girl of his dreams. Everything around him reminded him of her. Going back home seemed like the only way out. Douglas returned home and found a job at the construction site. And that's when the matchmaking started. His mother believed it was time for him to start a family, especially since there were many potential brides available. She repeatedly drew Douglas's attention to Isabel, emphasising her beauty, thrifty nature and desirability as a bride. Isabel, a former classmate, had transformed into a lovely girl. She made a good impression with her kind eyes and modest, pleasant demeanour. Of course, she did not have the bright appearance of Bianca, but in general, 
few could compare to Bianca anyway. One day, Douglas invited Isabel to the movies, and their relationship began from that date. Douglas did everything right, giving her flowers, surprising her with thoughtful gestures, and taking her on dates. Isabel eventually confessed that she had been in love with Douglas since the sixth grade. I never imagined that one day you would care for me like this, she said softly. You were different from everyone else, better than anyone. I used to secretly admire you, and always tried to be near you without anyone noticing. Douglas looked at Isabel in awe, and suddenly felt a deep sense of sympathy towards her. He now understood her feelings because he had once been in her position when he was dating Bianca. Isabel, I've wanted to tell you, or rather ask you, for a long time. I had planned to do it in a more formal way, but I think this is the right moment. Will you be my wife? Overcome with excitement, Isabel exhaled and tightly embraced Douglas around the neck. They got married, and thanks to their parents, they purchased a separate house in the same village. They believed it was best for the grandparents to be nearby, while they raised their future children. Isabel turned out to be a wonderful wife, always keeping the house clean, cosy, and filled with delicious aromas. She had an uncanny ability to sense Douglas's mood. If he came home feeling down, Isabel would immediately prepare a hot bath for him, and if he wanted some time alone, she would visit friends or her parents. She was loving, caring, and calm. About a year and a half after their wedding, they welcomed their first daughter into the world. Douglas initially wanted to name her Bianca, but later changed his mind, and they decided on Holly. Tragedy struck when little Holly was only two years old. Isabel's parents were killed in a car accident. Douglas did his best to support Isabel during this difficult time. His parents also tried to be there for their daughter-in-law and assist her in any way they could. Isabel often expressed her gratitude for Douglas's strong and reliable support during those trying times. If it weren't for you and our daughter, I don't know how I would have survived it all. Douglas deeply sympathized with his wife and felt genuine happiness seeing her gradually recover and regain her zest for life. Three more years passed and they welcomed their second daughter. Her arrival brought joy back into their lives. Isabel smiled again, just as she had before. The presence of two young children in the house showcased Isabel's exceptional motherhood skills. How did she manage to do it all? Taking care of the children, maintaining a clean home, cooking, and still finding time to pay attention to her husband. They even managed to go to the movies and dine out, just like in their youth. Isabel was the initiator and organizer of these outings. Life needs variety, she would say to her husband. Especially for a hard-working man like you, it's important to rest and relax. Douglas was the sole breadwinner. Isabel had graduated in the city as an accountant, but there were no suitable place for her in the village. So they decided together that Isabel would take care of the children and the house, while Douglas would provide for the family financially. It was a traditional arrangement, and many families in their village followed a similar pattern. Isabel frequently expressed her appreciation for everything Douglas did for them. You still want a son, don't you? Don't you? Isabel would sometimes ask. All men dream of having heirs. What about having a third baby? But Douglas had no desire for a third child. He was increasingly realizing that this life was not meant for him. At first, after a painful breakup with Bianca and the subsequent disappointment, the peaceful life that Isabel provided seemed like salvation. But now the house, the family, the life, all of it felt like an inescapable swamp that was pulling him down, suffocating him. From the outside, he appeared to be a successful person. His salary at the construction company was decent. His wife was caring, faithful and loving, agreeing with him on everything, even after ten years of marriage. His daughters were beautiful and clever. Everything seemed perfect and joyful. But Douglas was plagued 
by an indescribable longing. He yearned to live in a big city with a woman like Bianca. Douglas had almost resigned himself to the life of a family man. He worked, spent time with his children, performed household chores, and on Saturdays, he celebrated the end of the week with his male friends at a local bar. His colleagues and friends led similar lives and seemed content with their destinies. However, one day, as Douglas was returning home from the work, he noticed something out of the ordinary. There was a slim girl wearing short shorts and a tight-fitting top. The locals did not dress like that. Their fashion consisted of stretched t-shirts and sweatpants. The young beauty immediately caught Douglas's attention. She was sitting in a chair, leaning back and clearly sunbathing. She wore a wide-brimmed hat, her long hair the color of melted chocolate, and dark glasses covering half her face. She looked like someone who belonged in an upscale resort. In this cluttered village courtyard, she seemed like a stranger from another world. Strangely, she reminded him of Bianca. Douglas, is that you? The beauty called out, noticing that she was being watched. Yes, Douglas replied, taken aback, as he approached to get a closer look at the stranger who had already removed her hat and glasses. And then everything became clear to Douglas. It was Chandra, the girl from the city who occasionally visited her great aunt during vacations. She lived in the nearest town and studied at some prestigious school. Chandra was younger than Douglas by five to six years, so there couldn't be any friendship between them due to the age difference. Douglas always saw Chandra as a child. During her infrequent visits, Chandra was always part of a large, childish group of villagers of different ages. Then, for some reason, she stopped coming to visit her elderly relative. And now, Chandra, beautiful and tanned, had returned to the village and was speaking to him, as if they had only seen each other last week. It felt so simple, natural, and uninhibited. The man thought he had already stopped dreaming of such model-like gorgeous beauties. But no, now that Chandra was so close, Douglas once again felt the desire to have a woman like her by his side. You've changed. Chandra carefully observed Douglas, sending shivers down his spine. You've become so brutal. And you've grown up. The man smiled. I didn't even recognize you at first. Of course. The last time we saw each other, I was only thirteen. Then my dad was transferred to the capital, and an entirely different life began. I didn't have time to come here any more. It's a pity because my fondest childhood memories are associated with this place. We had so much fun together. We were real friends, and we had all sorts of adventures. I even wrote about them in my diary afterwards. And you know what? That's when I first fell in love with you. Wow! Douglas could only utter. It felt as if a bucket of boiling water had been poured over him and even his back was sweating. This woman was enchanting. And now, such a confession. It turns out that a young Chandra had once been in love with him, a simple village guy named Douglas. Well, what's so surprising about that? Chandra shrugged her elegant shoulders. You were tall, tanned, and older than me. Teenage girls like guys like you. You were clever and charming, and you had muscles. You were simply a dream, but at the time you seemed unattainable to me. The locals said that you were studying in the city and dating a model, and I was just a lanky girl. Douglas smiled, suddenly feeling confident and strong. It was clear that Chandra was still sympathizing with him. Her huge brown eyes showed clear interest. Tell me, how are you? The girl suddenly asked, signaling that she was ready for a long conversation. Douglas dryly mentioned that he was married and had two children. And you? Douglas countered, trying to avoid discussing his family life. I live and work in the capital city. I'm currently single. I have no plans for new relationships either, as the previous ones were too painful. I came here to heal my wounds. This place has a special atmosphere, Chandra replied. I hadn't noticed, Douglas admitted. 
It's just a village. Why do you have emotional wounds? It's a long story, Chandra smiled radiantly. If you want to hear it, come to the river this evening around ten o'clock when it gets dark. I'll tell you then. I'll be there, Douglas nodded. They chatted a bit more and then said goodbye until evening. Douglas didn't mention his conversation with Chandra to his wife, let alone their appointment at the river. He didn't think there was anything wrong with it. They were just childhood friends having a friendly conversation. They wouldn't be going on a date at the river, would they? They would simply sit and reminisce about the past, sharing stories about their lives. When Douglas arrived at the river at the appointed time, Chandra was already waiting for him. She was sitting on the rickety wooden steps that led to the water. Her long hair flowed down her graceful back, making her look like a beautiful but somewhat sad mermaid. Hi, Chandra exclaimed joyfully when she saw Douglas. You know I thought you wouldn't come. Well, how could I not? We had an agreement. The man smiled. Thank you for coming. I probably need someone to talk to. It's just... I can't tell everyone what happened to me, not in front of friends, family or co-workers. We all play certain roles. That's what everyone does where I live now. Do you have time to listen to my story? Douglas silently nodded. He was ready to sit with her until dawn, admiring her delicate profile. What could be better? Chandra shivered slightly. It was chilly by the river something the girl hadn't considered when leaving her house. Douglas readily took off his sweater and offered it to her. Gratefully, she pulled the pullover over herself and miraculously looked even more stylish and attractive. Douglas loved seeing her in his clothes. It gave him a special pleasure and the opportunity to take care of her beauty. After university, Chandra got a job in a large company as a corporate psychologist. She enjoyed the work, and the salary was more than satisfactory. Soon she moved out of her parents' house and rented a studio apartment near the office to avoid spending hours commuting every day. Her life was easy and carefree. Chandra went clubbing with her girlfriends, travelled to other cities and countries, went to the beach and socialised a lot. She occasionally had bright but short-lived romances. But one day, a man came to the office where she worked. He was tall, mature and well-dressed in a stylish business suit, with an expensive watch on his wrist. Chandra immediately realised that he was a high flyer, possibly a partner or sponsor of their company. The man headed towards the director's office, and Chandra watched him with interest. She was immediately attracted to him, although she never dreamed of having a relationship with such a man. He was wealthy, and consequently she assumed he was arrogant and used to everyone bowing down before him. That's why Chandra preferred to socialise with people on her own level. It was easier, clearer and more interesting. But for some reason, ever since the man had entered into the chief's office, Chandra couldn't stop thinking about him. It must have been that notorious chemistry, Chandra said, looking away at the opposite shore. How else can I explain this interest of mine? Rich, successful, even famous people have visited the chief before, but they didn't interest me. And then he came. After about an hour, the man left the office and their gazes unexpectedly met. Chandra felt a surge of heat. An electric shock ran through her from head to toe. Up close, the stranger seemed even more attractive than from afar. His eyebrows had a noble arch, his chin was strong-willed, and his black eyes were intelligent. Both of them stood frozen in the middle of the corridor for a few moments, and then he smiled. That smile softened his somewhat stern features and warmly resonated in Chandra's heart. What beautiful girls work here! The man said, scrutinising Chandra from head to toe. I even lost my speech at first. The stranger introduced himself as Albert. He had stopped by Chandra's boss on business. Albert had his own small factory and was a partner of the company where Chandra worked. Why don't we meet tonight somewhere nice? Albert got straight to the point. 
in the aftermath. Chandra often observed that this was one of his characteristic traits, business acumen. The man didn't like to beat around the bush. He was direct, sometimes too direct. That night, they dined at a luxurious restaurant downtown. It was a new experience for Chandra. Albert showed her a wholly different life. There were luxurious resorts, expensive gifts, trips to country clubs. Chandra couldn't even imagine the existence of some of these exotic places. But that wasn't the main thing. Chandra enjoyed the feeling of being the girlfriend of such a powerful, successful and wealthy man. She noticed how others looked at him, sometimes with respect, sometimes with admiration, sometimes with subservience. Some of that attitude was automatically transferred to her. Chandra felt like a queen of the world. It seemed that if she asked Albert to get a star from the sky, he could do it. Of course, Chandra fell in love, and the closer she got to know Albert, the stronger her feelings became. While others saw him as a stern, authoritative, decisive and self-confident, Chandra saw a different side of him. With her, he was kind, soft, gentle and caring. He often shared stories about his childhood with Chandra. She learned that on his path to success, Albert had to fight not only with competitors and ill-wishers, but also with his own fears. It is hard to imagine now, but once Albert was afraid of many things, failure, poverty, even responsibility, but he overcame them all. Chandra's respect for him grew after hearing these stories. Albert seemed to love Chandra too. He complimented her, called her affectionate nicknames and looked at her admiringly. However, he never hid the fact that he was married. Yes, Albert had a wife and two children who lived in London, where his sons attended a prestigious English college. His wife was with their children, while Albert ran his business here, providing for his family and periodically visiting them. Chandra knew what she was getting into by becoming the mistress of a wealthy married man. She had heard many times that such men never abandoned their families for the sake of young and beautiful girlfriends. But deep down, Chandra hoped for a miracle. She believed that Albert would realize she was the woman of his dreams. He would divorce his wife and propose to her. She would support his relationship with his children and even try to befriend them. They would be together, get married, and live a soulful life together. Chandra couldn't imagine her life without Albert. Every day, her attachment to him grew stronger, but suddenly, he started to distance himself. Albert became cold and indifferent, attributing it to a new project he was developing. However, Chandra noticed that his eyes no longer lit up with admiration when he looked at her, and it scared her. Chandra tried to rekindle their relationship. She bought beautiful lingerie, experimented with her appearance, and cooked his favourite dishes to impress him. But nothing helped. Albert would say some compliments and smile politely, but she could clearly sense that he was getting bored. Chandra hoped it was just a relationship crisis, but eventually her worst fears were confirmed. It happened right on my birthday. Chandra looked up at Douglas with pain-filled eyes, and he immediately wanted to embrace her, hold her tight and comfort her. I thought, I thought he'd surprise me, like he used to. He did, but it wasn't what I expected at all. The first thing Chandra saw that morning when she woke up and looked out the window was a bright red car with a huge red bow parked in the parking lot right in front of her driveway. Her heart filled with joy as she thought, it's a present from Albert. Chandra had recently seen the same car with a dreamy look, and Albert noticed it and apparently understood everything. He smiled and said that dreams should come true. Chandra couldn't help but smile, thinking that maybe things weren't so bad between them if Albert was so attentive to her. Chandra took a picture of the car from the window and sent it to Albert with the caption, Somebody's lucky. Albert replied with a message. Happy birthday. A beautiful car for a beautiful girl. The keys are in your mailbox. I'll call you later. 
in a meeting right now. Filled with excitement, Chandra went downstairs. She removed the bow from the car and got behind the wheel, feeling a wave of happiness being in such a beautiful car. She was even happier knowing that Albert had gone to great lengths to please her. But then, then he called, and Chandra's voice trembled as she spoke, and Douglas realised that she was close to bursting into tears. Unable to resist, he put his arm around Chandra's shoulders, and she gratefully clung to him. After taking a deep breath, she composed herself and continued the story. Albert said it was time to part ways. He said it with a tone that allowed no objections. He said he was fine with me, but some day everything had its end, and he didn't need this relationship any more. I asked him what I had done wrong, and where I had made a mistake. I swore that I would be the best for him, but it was all in vain. He had simply met someone else. That's all. Later, I learned that Albert periodically changes young girlfriends. It's a normal thing for him, and he also loves his wife very much, and was never going to leave her. He just gets bored sometimes, so he starts a new relationship. It was very hard for me to suddenly feel like one of many. I also missed him on a purely physical level. It was hard to get used to life without his voice, his touch, his smell. My heart ached, as if a piece of it had been torn out. I didn't want to live. I even went to a therapist. I kept following his life. I saw his new girlfriend, my replacement, so to speak. She's beautiful, of course, and so radiant. But that girl is going to end up like me sooner or later. At first, I thought about going to the sea. But we've been to resorts so often with Albert. All that packing, hotels, airports... Everything would remind me of him, and I couldn't have that, you know. And then I remember my grandmother in the village, whom I hadn't visited for a long time. I've always found peace and joy and good times here. Chandra smiled at last. Her smile made her face even more beautiful, and Douglas couldn't help but smile back. They were still holding each other in their arms, savouring the moment. Coming here was the best decision I've made in the last few years. Chandra continued. The atmosphere here is so healing. And then, then I met you, my first love. I wanted to feel something like that childhood feeling again. Have you felt it? Douglas asked. You know, Chandra suddenly looked Douglas straight in the eye. Something, something stirred in my soul. But there's only one thing I want so badly. What is it? Instead of answering, Chandra kissed Douglas. The man, pulling her closer, eagerly responded to the unexpected kiss. At first, thoughts flashed through his head that it was wrong, that they shouldn't be doing this, forgetting about his wife and children, giving in to an impulse. But then, he stopped thinking about anything at all. They spent the entire night together, as dawn approached, Douglas accompanied Chandra back to her house. He didn't regret anything. The only thing he didn't want was to part with her. He realized that he couldn't live without her any more. He was drawn to Chandra like a magnet. Douglas and Chandra met in secret for about a week. Douglas told his wife that he was visiting a neighbor whose wife had recently passed away, and he wanted to support him. Isabel, as always believed every word Douglas said, and praised him for his sensitivity. And then, Chandra suggested that he go with her to the capital. My vacation is ending, the woman said sadly as they sat on the shore, admiring the distant sunset. It's time to go home. I don't want to leave without you. I can't even imagine you leaving, Douglas confessed sincerely. Then, come with me. Chandra simply suggested, What's keeping you here? Work with its small salary? You'll earn so much more in the city. It's good for you. For me. For your family. At least they'll finally have some decent money. And we can live at my place. Come on, agree. I don't even need to think about it. 
I'm coming with you. I don't want a life without you. It's the first time something like this has happened to me. Chandra smiled, clearly pleased to hear such words. Don't tell your wife anything about us. Just tell her you're going to earn money. She'll get used to it without you. Get a taste of money and then the news won't hurt Isabel so much. Just imagine how she'll feel hearing it so suddenly. I've been in her shoes, so I understand perfectly well. You shouldn't do that. You have to be gentler. Douglas agreed with Chandra's suggestion. He decided not to explain the situation to his wife in person to avoid unnecessary questions and lamentations. He wrote a letter of resignation at his work, then came home during lunchtime when no one was there. He quickly packed his things and scribbled a letter for Isabel, informing her that he was going to earn money. In just a few hours, Douglas and Chandra were sitting on a train headed to the capital. Douglas was filled with anticipation for a new happy life, the life he had always dreamed of. However, things didn't go as planned. It simply didn't work out in the end. The capital immediately overwhelmed Douglas with its crowding, noise and frantic pace of life, while Chandra seemed to thrive in this environment. Working and socialising with friends, Douglas quickly realised that life in the city was not for him. Despite his hopes of eventually adapting and finding himself, nothing seemed to work out, especially with finding a suitable job. Douglas kept coming across positions that offered low salaries, earning barely enough to make ends meet, let alone send money back home to his family. Meanwhile, Isabel believed in the story Douglas had told her. During their phone conversations, she continued to offer him support and asked about his well-being, what he was eating, and expressed sympathy for his situation. In general, she behaved like a typical concerned wife. Douglas grew increasingly frustrated with Isabel's questions and was constantly rude to her, pushing her away. It was difficult to continue lying to her and listen to her consolations. Eventually, Isabel's calls became less frequent and then stopped altogether. Douglas felt relieved, as he already had enough problems in his life without his annoying wife. Work didn't pan out as Douglas had hoped. He dreamed of finding a job that would allow him to take Chandra to restaurants and buy her gifts, that his dream of a decent income remained just a dream. Chandra, at first, was gentle, caring and supportive, providing advice and making Douglas feel like a prince. However, as time went on, Douglas noticed that she was growing distant. He couldn't blame her. After all, what was he? A village loser who couldn't seem to do anything. And she was beautiful, smart and sophisticated. Douglas felt inadequate, compared to Chandra. He tried his best, worked hard but saw no results. He believed that there had to be some grand gesture that would make Chandra see him as a determined and strong man. The more Douglas thought about it, the more he realised that he needed to tell Isabel everything, seek a divorce and propose to Chandra. Douglas kept his plans and thoughts to himself, wanting to surprise Chandra. One day, he returned to his village. As Douglas walked along the familiar rural streets, his heart was pounding. How would Isabel react to the news? Would she become hysterical and try to reason with her unfaithful husband? With shaky legs, Douglas entered the house. It was quiet, and it seemed that their daughters had gone to visit friends or take a walk, as there was no laughter or chatter coming from their rooms. Isabel emerged from the kitchen at the sound of footsteps. She was wearing a blue dress, her hair pulled back in a tight bun, and she had no makeup on her face, just as usual. When she saw Douglas, she warmly and sincerely smiled. "'You're back,' she said. "'So people were lying.' Douglas was too irritable to pay attention to her remark about people who lie. "'Hi,' he said. "'Where are the kids?' They went to the pond with the neighbourhood kids. Well, why are you standing in the doorway? Come in. Maybe you're hungry. I have a roast in the oven, and the pies are almost ready. No, Douglas shook his head. We need to talk. Isabel turned pale, nodded silently, 
and went back into the kitchen. Douglas followed her, and both of them remained silent. Isabel waited, and Douglas struggled to find the right words to begin the serious conversation. I need a divorce, he finally managed to say. I could have applied to the court myself, and you would have been notified, but I decided it's better to talk directly about everything. Sad to hear. Isabel lowered her head, feeling sad and hurt. However, she didn't appear surprised or taken aback. It was as if she had anticipated this outcome. I have another woman. I don't want to continue lying to you. That's why I'm here. No, you have found her not in the city, Isabel sighed. But here, her name is Chandra. Don't you think people haven't seen you by the river? You grew up in a village. You know that it's hard to hide anything here. You've fallen for the charms of a city girl. She will heal her wounds and then discard you. Don't you get it? You're trying to change your destiny. I pity you. These words from his wife made Douglas angry. What did she know about his relationship with Chandra? What right did she have to speak like that? Do you pity me? Douglas asked, looking at his wife intently. You? Me? Yes, Isabel sadly nodded her head. You won't be able to find happiness with her. You're ruining your life with your own hands. You'll regret it later. This made Douglas angry. I'm not happy with you. You've gotten that. You've turned into a clumsy cow. I can't talk to you, and I can't be seen with you in public. I can't continue living with you. I'm even repulsed by the sight of you. Douglas realised that he was saying cruel words to his wife. He shouldn't be doing this. He should be more gentle, more delicate. But he couldn't help himself. All the pent-up frustration from years of being married suddenly burst out. It was as if he were seeking revenge on his wife for having spent so much time with a woman who was far from his dreams, essentially betraying himself. Isabel listened, occasionally shaking her head, feeling pity for her spouse, who was trying to hurt her with every word. Douglas couldn't see it in her eyes, and it made him even more out of control. I'm leaving you because I can't live like this. I've always dreamed of someone else. We're... we're too different. And we're not right for each other. Well, Isabel sighed as her spouse spoke up and fell silent. I won't lie. I've always loved you. Since childhood. And even now. But I can't force you to love me. I'm sorry about that. But as for you... You can be completely free from me, from the children, from your obligations. I'm giving you complete freedom. Douglas stared at his wife in amazement. How? Is that it? No tears, no tantrums, no begging? The house stays with you when you're done with your new sweetheart. I know you will be. Anyway, you'll have a place to come back to. So, you'll return here to this very house... But the kids and I won't be here, so you won't have to deal with a fat cow any more. Don't worry. And where will you and the kids go? Douglas stared at his wife, astonished. He knew very well that she had no relatives or friends that could help Isabel move and settle into a new place, and in his opinion, Isabel didn't seem capable of doing anything other than cooking and cleaning. That's no longer your concern. Isabel shook her head. But don't worry about the kids. I found a job in the city, and housing is provided, so we'll be fine. Douglas was stunned. How was it possible his mild-mannered Isabel suddenly found a high-paying job in the city, and he, who was determined and intelligent, couldn't get a job there? When, when I first heard about you and Chandra, I didn't believe it. But then I pieced everything together and understood, so I started looking for a way out, and I found it. You're lying. Douglas refused to believe what he was hearing. It didn't match the personality of his warm and home-loving wife. 
It's just hard for you to imagine that I can manage without you. Isabel looked at her spouse with pity again. By the way, if you ever want to see the kids, I won't stop you. Just so you know. Pale-faced, Douglas stormed out of the house. After talking to his wife, he felt even more worthless than he did in Chandra's apartment. He had thought that at least now he would feel in control, show himself as the one in charge. But it didn't work. Douglas was furious with his wife. He felt envious of her success and completely defeated. Because Isabel pitied him while he was the one who left her. Douglas suddenly imagined his life was a train hurtling down the tracks. The man returned to Chandra in a gloomy mood. He informed her that he was getting a divorce from his wife. Chandra reacted to the news with indifference, showing no joy in her eyes, although her man would soon be free. Douglas felt Chandra slipping away. They were already living in the same apartment, almost like neighbours. Chandra would return late at night from clubs, without disclosing who she was with. Men would call her, and she would flirt with them directly. It was a painful experience for Douglas. For the second time in his life, he had managed to start a relationship with someone who could be called the woman of his dreams. She had a model appearance, a cheerful and easygoing character, sociability, charm and style. However, their romance was developing according to the same pattern as many years ago. Douglas's work was not going well at that time. He would seize any opportunity to make some money, but it was all temporary. Nevertheless, it helped him regain a bit of confidence. On such days, Douglas would buy Chandra gifts. Soon it became evident that Chandra was on the verge of a new romance. She was spending too much time on correspondence, smiling too mysteriously, and frequently coming home late at night. All of this caused Douglas genuine torment, because for her, he had left his family and quit his stable job, and headed towards an uncertain future. Eventually, Douglas and Isabel got divorced, and he received a certificate of his freedom. He chose not to attend the procedure, avoiding any contact with Isabel, and refusing to meet her gaze or talk to her. Why? Probably he was ashamed. He felt guilty of the way he treated his wife. She truly loved him, and now Douglas understood that. Devoid of the tenderness and care that Douglas was surrounded by next to Isabel, he realised how much it warmed and supported him. Many times, the thought crossed his mind that it was all for nothing, chasing a dream in the hope of a better life, thinking he deserved more. And now, here's the result. He lives in an apartment with a woman who doesn't notice him, and openly flirts with another man on the phone. Meanwhile, he is jobless, broke, without any prospects, friends, and without a family. So far, Chandra hadn't kicked Douglas out of the rented apartment. He believed it was out of pity, from the realisation of how ridiculous and pathetic his situation was. Douglas felt like a useless worm, knowing that sooner or later Chandra would ask him to leave. Finally, the day of clarification with Chandra came. That evening, Douglas managed to earn relatively good money. He had been working as a handyman at a construction site since early morning, and had done well. They asked him to come back the next day and paid him well. Douglas returned home in high spirits, feeling that all was not yet lost. Chandra had already come home from work. It was strange. She didn't usually show up until at least 9pm, if not later. Hi, the man smiled at her. What do you want for dinner? Rolls or pizza? Douglas wanted to hug Chandra, to hold her against him like he used to. She was beautiful. If she smiled at him sincerely and warmly like before, he would immediately forget about her coldness and telephone flirting. He would be the happiest man in the world. Still, Chandra's beauty mesmerised and bewitched him, making his head spin. Hi, Chandra replied, nervously winding a lock of long hair around her finger. I have to tell you something, but I don't know how. Anyway, you're going to have to leave here soon. Douglas wasn't surprised. He had been expecting such a statement for a long time, but his eyes still darkened. Between you and me, you see, it didn't work out between us, Chandra continued. I fell in love with you in the village. 
I thought so, at least. You looked at me like at a goddess. Anyone would have swooned. And I was going through a painful breakup. But here in the city, I realized that we're not a couple, and we could never be. You and I need other people. We're just very different. Douglas nodded, agreeing with every word the beauty said. Of course she was right. Chandra wasn't his type, and he was a real fool for not realizing it sooner. But Isabel saw it right away. She said that he and Chandra would never work out. However, Douglas only got angry at his wife, maybe because deep down he knew Isabel was right. He understood, but at the same time, he didn't want to accept it. I've met a man, she said excitedly. He's the one I want. He's the man of my dreams. We're attracted to each other, and today we're going to Thailand for a month, and then I'm moving in with him. We're going to live together now. Douglas listened and realized that now it was definitely over. There was no hope for a happy outcome. The apartment is paid until the end of the month. Chandra moved on to everyday matters. So, you need to find another place to live. Douglas nodded glumly. But don't look at me like that, Chandra pleaded. I feel guilty as it is. I pulled you out of your life, separated you from your family. However, the divorce was your idea. You didn't let yourself go back. I did not approve of this step. Douglas turned around and walked out of the apartment. Near the front door, he managed to spot two half-opened suitcases. Chandra had already packed. Well, now he'd go outside, walk around for a few hours, think about the situation. Maybe stop at a bar and have a beer or two. He needed to relax, to relieve this terrible tension that stiffened his shoulders, his neck, his back. When Douglas returned, Chandra was gone, and so were her things. Some closets had been left open, now they were empty. Douglas felt empty inside, too. There were almost no emotions. Apathy. Deadly fatigue. That's all that the man felt. In the morning, the decision took shape by itself. He could not stay in the apartment, where everything reminded him of Chandra, and a failed attempt to settle in the capital. He had to return. Isabel would accept him, and eventually forgive him. Her soul is so wide, and she still loves her husband, albeit now an ex. True, his wife said something about moving, working in the city, but surely Isabel hadn't succeeded. If he, a man, did not find himself in the capital, what can be said about her, a single mother with two children. Douglas allowed the idea that Isabel tried to go to the city, tried to settle down here, but probably already returned home, because unlike him, she quickly realised that such a life is not for her. He'll come back to her. The first time will be difficult for both Isabel and him, but then life will go back to normal. Douglas's only dream now was that everything would go back to the way it was before. He's smarter now. He knows that fantasies and dreams don't do any good. Douglas has learned to appreciate what he has and realizes that not all desires should come true. That was Douglas's sweet thoughts. And one beautiful August morning, the man returned to his native village. With his heart pounding frantically, he entered his familiar yard and saw a closed shutter and a large padlock on the front door. This indicated only one thing. The house was empty, and had been for a long time. It's unbelievable. But Isabel and the kids aren't here. Could it be? Could it be that his ex-wife still managed to find herself in the capital? Douglas felt as if he had been kicked in the solar plexus. Without thinking long, he went to the neighbours. He needed to know where his wife was now. What was happening to her? But where she was working, where she was living now, no one knew. Douglas could feel the judgment coming from people. Someone told him to his face that what he did was wrong. Some just looked at the man with disapproval. He didn't care. The main thing was to find out about the fate of his children and wife. And even Douglas's own mother did not know where Isabel had gone. You've come back after all, 
The woman met her son unkindly. You have made a mess of things, and now you've come back with your tail between your legs. You're a fool. You broke your own happiness with your own hands. Your Isabel is in the capital now. I don't know where. She didn't tell me. Only promised me she'd bring the girls back before school for a couple of weeks. So I'm waiting for my granddaughters. She doesn't hold a grudge against me, and she doesn't hold a grudge against you either. A holy woman, a pure soul. But you, how could you do that to her? Douglas only waved his hand. He could not listen to his mother's reproaches now, although they were fair. In the evening, Douglas visited Monica, an old friend of Isabel's. If anyone knew about the location of his ex-wife who had disappeared from the radar, it was her. Oh, Douglas is back. Monica smiled. Come in. Isabel told me this would happen. Do you know where she is? asked the man. I know, Monica nodded. Isabel asked me to tell you everything so you wouldn't worry. Though for me, you should still suffer ignorance. You deserved it. Don't you agree? Douglas nodded. He had nothing to object to Monica. Isabel is doing well now. Monica began her story. She lives in the capital, in a wonderful, bright and spacious apartment. I recently visited her with my children. Isabel also has a job as an accountant at the factory, where she is highly valued. How? How did she manage to do it? Douglas asked in amazement. Oh, that's the most interesting part of the story. Monica smiled, looking a little mockingly at her guest. Okay. Listen, I won't keep you waiting. Isabel knew that Douglas was not going to the capital to earn money. She was aware that her husband was going to the capital with Chandra, knowing about their affair. The observant fisherman, who often enjoyed night fishing and had trouble sleeping, saw the sweet couple several times on the shore. As an old friend of Isabel's father, he felt it was his duty to inform her about what he had witnessed. Soon the whole village learned about Douglas's private life. Isabel didn't want to believe what was happening, but she started noticing changes in Douglas. Nevertheless, she hoped that it would pass and be forgotten, like a terrible dream. Then suddenly, Douglas announced that he was going to earn money, and Isabel knew he was leaving with Chandra. Isabel cried a lot when you left. Monica shook her head sadly. I felt so sorry for her. I tried to calm her down and told her that you would have a good time and come back, that you weren't going anywhere. It was clear to everyone that there was no future for you with Chandra. You two were too different. Only you didn't see it. I guess your feelings blinded you. I feel sorry for you now, but back then I was angry. Angry because Isabel was hurt and sick, and you did this to her. Isabel decided not to show her husband that she was aware of his affair. She still hoped that Douglas would come back. However, as time passed, Douglas remained in the capital, and her hope dwindled. Even financial problems began to arise. The family had relied on Douglas's income, and Isabel hadn't worked since the children were born, as she was taking care of them. Now the poor woman was faced with financial difficulties as well. You didn't even think about what it's like for Isabel to be alone with the kids, Monica reproached Douglas. I helped Isabel as much as I could and got her a job as a cleaner on a farm. There were no other jobs available. The salary was meagre, but it was better than nothing. But it wasn't enough. And, moreover, Isabel wasn't herself because of your betrayal. She looked gaunt, had dark circles under her eyes and often felt dizzy. She held on for the girls, and then fate itself gave her a way out. It seemed like fate had decided that Isabel had suffered enough. During the summer, many people from the city visited the village. They rented houses for the season, seeking peace, quiet, and the beauty of nature. Isabel often saw an elderly woman who lived alone in a small house with a green roof. Unlike most city dwellers, she preferred the tranquility of the village. One day, that elderly woman suddenly fell ill on the street. It was probably due to overheating in the sun or a heart problem. 
When Isabel saw her distressed, she rushed to help. Isabel brought Mrs. Scott to her house, helped her to bed, and provided her with water. Once Mrs. Scott felt better, she and Isabel started talking. The elderly woman was grateful to have someone to talk to and eagerly shared her life story. Mrs. Scott had been a deputy director of a large factory before retiring. Despite the well-deserved rest, she felt unhappy and lonely. Mrs. Scott's husband had passed away long ago, and she had no friends among her neighbours. She once had a daughter named Hope, who was smart, beautiful, and full of hope. Hope had become a young graduate student at a prestigious university. Throughout her life, Mrs. Scott and her husband had focused on their careers, which is why they only had one child. As she grew older, Mrs. Scott started regretting that decision. They could have handled a couple more children, maybe even three. However, at the time, prioritising their careers seemed like the right choice. The parents adored their only daughter, but a tragic accident cut short Hope's life. The girl was returning home in the evening after passing another exam with an excellent grade. That evening, while crossing the street, Hope was struck by a drunk driver. The driver couldn't even remember how it happened. The accident was at a high speed, leaving Hope with no chance of survival. Mrs. Scott and her husband never fully recovered from the loss. Both of them withdrew into their grief, and it took many years before they could create some semblance of a normal life. Six years after the tragedy, Mrs. Scott's husband died of a heart attack. He had never complained about his health before, but Mrs. Scott knew that grief had taken a toll on her beloved spouse. Now, Mrs. Scott was left all alone. She had always considered herself unsociable, but now she longed for someone to talk to. Her friends and former colleagues were busy with their own families, children and grandchildren, leaving her with no one to confide in. Isabel genuinely felt sorry for Mrs. Scott, and they started communicating. One day, while narrating her own story, Isabel couldn't hold back her tears. Mrs. Scott comforted her, and then offered her a wonderful solution. Her daughter's apartment was still vacant, because Mrs. Scott didn't want to let strangers in, and she didn't need tenants, as she was not financially struggling. And the elderly woman offered Isabel and her children to move into the apartment free of charge. Sounds like a fairy tale. Douglas shook his head as he listened to Monica's story. He couldn't imagine that a stranger had offered to help a woman they didn't know, especially one with children. It just didn't make sense to him. Yes, it does sound like a miracle, Monica agreed. But Isabel deserved it, and Mrs. Scott too. She's not alone any more. She and Isabel live near each other, and soul to soul. Mrs. Scott got her a job at the factory where she used to work. They accepted her protégé. Isabel is working there now. She has remembered everything she learned in college, and she's already doing well. However, with Isabel, it couldn't be any other way. She's responsible and a decent woman. Douglas asked Monica for Isabel's address. He really wanted to see his ex-wife and daughters. He was going to ask Isabel for forgiveness and was mentally prepared for the fact that she might reject him. Douglas suddenly realised that he had also loved Isabel all these years. His feelings for her were different from those he had for Bianca or Chandra. It was deep attachment, not passion, not a passing fancy. The train arrived at the station early in the morning before dawn. Douglas quickly found the right house and waited. He decided that as soon as Isabel came out, he would immediately go to her and beg for forgiveness. As the sun slowly began to rise, people started coming out of the building. Every time the door opened, Douglas's heart sank with anxiety. And then, finally, Isabel appeared at the entrance. She had changed. She had a fashionable hairstyle and was wearing a stylish dress. She looked absolutely magnificent. And why hadn't Douglas noticed how beautiful she was before? However, Douglas didn't approach his ex-wife because Isabel was not alone. She was walking with a man. He was a handsome man, obviously very successful. 
They were looking at each other, talking and smiling. The man held Isabel around the waist so tenderly that it was clear he was in love with her, and meant a lot to her. Douglas stayed far away, not daring to approach. From there, he watched as Isabel and the stranger got into a beautiful car and drove away on the still nearly empty street. It was at that moment that Douglas realised he was too late, and things would never be the same as before.